Hello. Hello. Welcome to Salem the Podcast. We are your hosts and favorite Salem tour guides. My name is Sarah Black. And I'm Jeffrey Lilly. Today, we're going to be talking about Elias Haskett Derby. Exciting. You've heard us talk about him like a lot, a couple Uh, times. A little, yeah. He was at least mentioned um, in our episode on Salem's maritime history, uh, sea trade. He was kind of one of the main players. Big guy. So we're going to get into his life history and some of what makes him fascinating. Uh, But before we do, we got a little housekeeping to take care of. So we want to do a quick shout out and thank you to Christian and Erica of Deal Marcus and the Salem Common Neighborhood Association. So thank you to all of you for inviting us and and having you having us as your guest speakers. Yeah, just this past weekend, we were asked to attend uh, Deal Marcus's first of hopefully several movie nights, which was a lot of fun. They showed the movie Clue. (gasps) It was so fun. Who done it? Yeah, I had never seen the full thing. <laughs> so so, <laughs> so you you had claimed, and I'm not going to throw you under the bus too much, okay, that you, you'd seen like 80% of it. I thought I had. And and I was like, well, you've never seen. For those of you who, who know, you know. If you don't know, go watch the movie Clue. Uh, but the ending is something special. And so I knew you hadn't seen that. Mm-hmm. And so to be able to sort of watch you <laughs> react to what's going on in the end of that movie... Priceless. Priceless. I think that if I would have seen 80%, I would have recognized that our friend Kate was wearing Miss Scarlet's dress when she (laughs) came out of her room. Like it took me about 10 minutes into the movie to realize that that was the dress itself. It's like, oh shoot, I really haven't seen this. But it was awesome. Like the the group of people they had gathered in that space were just eating it up. The laughter was, uh, it was was a great movie. So much fun. Great movie. But they let us, or let us, they invited us to speak about uh, the game Clue. A little bit, a bit about the history of how it ties to Salem, the Parker brothers, and the murder of Captain White at the Gardner Pingree House, which we're going to be doing an entire episode on. I think we did get a request right off the bat when we announced this podcast if we would be talking about murders in town, specifically the Gardner Pingree yep. House. And 100%, it is on the docket for the first year. Should be coming down the line in a couple months. Absolutely. I did want to say, um, if you are in town, please stop by Deal Marcus. They're relatively new here. I think they opened last year, right? Two years. Two years ago. They are located at 11 Central Street. It's right to the left of my favorite, Red's Mm -hmm. Sandwich Shop. It's it's that building with the two staircases that that go up, and everyone likes to get their picture taken at the top, so go get your picture taken and go inside do some shopping. But if you're visiting Salem, they've got an event space inside, and they're going to be doing events pretty consistently so check out their facebook check out uh their website and and see all sorts of stuff they got going on just to give you a sense on may 14th they've got an 18 course sushi menu coming up and then shortly thereafter a bingo and burlesque event so so sad i have to miss the sushi Uh, christian said to me and it really stuck with me he says we don't want to be the cool kids Mm -hmm. we just want to be the place where all the cool kids come to hang out let's do it they totally are the cool kids. I mean. <laughs> 100%. Just so you guys know, you are definitely cool kids. And we appreciate uh, you. But I'm excited to see what happens with this space and uh, all the things that we're going to be able to do this summer. Yeah. Another quick thing. Remember when we asked folks to write in if they had encountered a tour that talked about the tunnels? Well, we did hear from someone, and I'm going to read it. Oh, whoa, 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 okay. We will bleep out names of tours because we're definitely not looking to throw anyone under the bus and once again do not say anything to your don't call your tour guide out while you're on tour but it says hi sarah and jeffrey i just listened to the catacombs episode and had to write in i took a tour in 2018 and the guide told us there were tunnels underneath bunghole liquors but not sure if he was just making a bunghole joke ha (laughs) <laughs> okay, that's, that's kind of That's cute. pretty good. He was generally not very happy we were visiting in October, and I think he just was not excited to give tours. Love your podcast, and thank you for bringing Salem to me in the Midwest every week. Can't wait to come back. I really want to stay at The Merchant. And that is from Cassie of Illinois. Oh, well, thank you. We appreciate that. 
Uh, we're actually going to be talking a little bit about Merchant today. I know, very convenient. Uh, so good timing on that one. Um, I guess when it comes to these sorts of things in the tunnels, so I think one thing we want to sort of double down on is we're not saying that there are no basements or doorways or passageways right. uh, underneath one building to another building or in, in some parts of the city. There are not miles and miles and miles <laughs> of smuggling tunnels full of opium and prostitution. There never were, never has been. I can't say never will be, but it's unlikely. And if I recall correctly, one of the articles I stumbled on that was in reference to tunnels and like a system of tunnels underneath the West Coast in, Mm -hmm. I think it was Salem, Oregon, Mm -hmm. it's described going underneath a current liquor store and gaining access to this system of tunnels. So I do worry, you know, it could have been one of those situations where it's just populated. Oh, and side note, my roommate came home just after listening to the tunnel episode, first thing she says when she bursts through the door, I totally think you're right. It's, it totally makes sense. It's, it's the tour guides. <laughs> it's the tours. Because it just, it, where did it come from? Where did it come from? So, so I just imagined that scene in my head. Uh, if, if you've watched Seinfeld as, as Kramer bursting <laughs> through the door, I think you're right. <laughs> It was so validating. (laughs) But then, no joke, about a half hour later, I received a message from someone who used to work at Opus. And, like, he was the sound guy and very involved in the Opus underground. He claimed that when they were doing construction on the underground, they found a body. So, like, I don't know how accurate that is. I got to do some digging. If anyone knows any leads on this, let me know. Hey, that's not entirely unprobable, right? Right. Like, what was here 200 years ago? Was it just someone's backyard that was a, a, a graveyard? Absolutely. Um, could it have been uh, indigenous land yep. that someone had, had been buried on? A, a family plot in a basement uh, tomb? All these things are possible. And actually... We got a cemetery episode coming up, which we might talk about some of that in. Yeah. So once again, there are things underneath the buildings, but no system of of tunnels. Go to Paris. We are happy that this topic generated some conversations, both outside of Salem, in Salem, and controversy, and some controversy. Someone actually told us that that's when you're doing it right. <laughs> but I think that is, is that all we got. I think that is all we got. So let's talk Elias Haskett Derby. America's first millionaire. Arguably. Yep. At least one of the wealthiest. Definitely Salem's first millionaire. Um, Definitely one of the most wealthy people to come out of Salem. mm -hmm. And you'll still see remnants today. If you visit the city, you may walk down Derby Street. If you're in the harbor area, walk out on Derby Wharf, out to the lighthouse. You may have attended a market in Derby Square. Mm-hmm. The Derby name is, is still prominent uh, here in Salem, and for good reason. Like we said, they had all that wealth. They made a, a huge impact on the city, even to go so far as... Elias Haskell Derby was known as King Derby. Mentioned in the Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. So probably not during his time. Right. Uh, but he was post, called. Yeah. Uh, post. Humanously? Post humanously. Yeah. Uh, so an, a, a famous author in Salem. So 50 years later, that name was still so famous that he he pens it as King Derby. That must have even left an impression uh, at that point in history. So he was born on August 16th, 1737. Okay. Which would make him a Leo. (laughs) Sarah. I'm not I'm not one for horoscopes, but I (laughs) upon when I was just kind of, you know, trying to pull the dates together, I was curious, right? And plus everyone that comes to Salem's like, what's your sign? So so does this mean like we now have to like historically when we talk about historical figures. I kind of want to. Uh, I kind of hate you. <laughs> I also looked up, do you remember looking back at those old magazines? Like, you know, like the tabloids you would read as a kid. Well, in some of those, like one of the, those magazines, I always saw famous birthdays. Like if it was your birthday month that month, it yeah. would list oh, out. Like, so um, I, I know, uh, da, 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 shoot. Um, I used to know who was born on my birthday. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Victor Hugo. He wrote uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Um, so I, it's, that's just like one of those things that like I knew. 
right? You're just like, oh, yeah, yeah. But I think that some people share, like, a lot of famous birthdays. I didn't look mine up. Oh. But Elias Haskett Derby shares a birthday with Madonna. Okay. And also Steve Carell and James Cameron. Okay. So very ambitious folks. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's a, a Leo trait. It is. If you okay, my boss is a Leo. <laughs> we'll just stop there. Okay. <laughs> but uh, no, okay, that, that that's fair. So I, I guess for for those of you who are uh, interested in those sorts of things, now now you know. And it looks like we'll be anytime we profile a historical figure on here. Is there anyone we have to go back and do? I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay. So who was this guy? He was born in Salem to a family of merchants. His father, Richard, was a sea captain. Uh, and at that point, they already had garnered enough of a business mm -hmm. for this to really, I think, from the start, this was going to be his his career trajectory. This was what I mean, their family was all family about. Business, yeah. Right, right. Uh, but, but fun fact, yeah, okay. from, yeah. yeah, I was going to say, both of us read that Derby himself never stepped foot. I mean, I'm sure he stepped foot on... A boat, but he never went to sea. Yeah, all these grandiose trips he makes to the the Far East, the West Indies, all the way up to Saint Petersburg, Russia. He's never on any of them. They're all done on his ships with his ship captains who work for him. With uh, his money. With his money and his products, his son, his family, his name, uh, his brothers. Um, but he's. I, I don't necessarily want to say puppet master. He's the mastermind. Right? Like He's um, an entrepreneur. If you got that uh, like mob family mentality, he's like the mob boss, and he's sending all these guys out to do his, his work for him. Sounds like Jeff Bezos. <laughs> I, mean, like, I think that's who we compared him to in the yeah. earlier episode. He's, he's pretty accurate. Money. He's a great mind for business. And, you know, that's actually, I think, one of the things that, that really helps the Derby family is that – so it's a large family, and they there is someone who has that mind for business, and he's able to take the reins and make all these business decisions while there's all these other people in the family who are then able to go out and accomplish those tasks that he sets them to. Which is why the business itself is so successful. Yeah. And let's let's drop him, like my, my history chicks like to say, drop him in the history real quick just to formulate some context, give you a sense of what point of Salem's history mm -hmm. he is being born into. So now might be a good time to refer back to episode nine. Yes. Our black gold and pirates episode. Legal, legal. Legal. Legal pirates. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we didn't we didn't make that distinction in the title. Yeah. But uh, if you listen to the episode, you'll find out more about privateering. It'll give you some good context about the role Salem played during the Revolutionary War, during that global trade. Which then helps us tie Derby to that time frame. Yes, a exactly. An anchor him in time. Indeed. I yeah. Indeed. So he's born in the mid-1700s, right? And like we know that the trials are a little bit behind us and the Revolutionary War is coming up. Right. So he's sort of at this um, developmental time in... in Salem's history. Salem or pre-American right. uh, colonial history. Um, and his father's already in the shipping business um, or that seafaring mercantile trade. So he, he gets involved, and that's the family business. Um, so he gets involved in that. But like we said, he doesn't set foot on a boat, unlike his siblings. So he's, like, good with the books. Yeah, his dad's got him working behind the scenes yeah. as a bookkeeper. Right, so he, like, I don't know if, like, general manager or is, like, the right term, right? Assistant to the regional uh, so, manager. Yeah, yeah, but he's the one who is seeing... Not just like the life on the ship, but how all the product that's come import, export, taxes, customs house, uh, the wharf, hiring, firing, pay, scheduling, ships, building, bartering, all those other things that like he is then going to take control of. He, he gets started in that early in life. My guess is that his father probably saw a bit of smarts in him. Yeah, yeah. Recognize that potential. And he was willing to kind of show him the ropes from that angle. And, of course, Richard Derby probably knew you know, he's not going to continue on 
leading this business. He's going to have to pass it on to his kids. So, mm -hmm. And Elias takes the... Takes the reins, yeah. takes the head. And think about, too, I wonder if maybe there was a bit of fear of the sea. Just a terrifying place, especially back then. I mean, today, like, I don't know. It's... It... it someone... Someone asked me recently, like, what are you, what, what's, what's scarier, space or the ocean? And, and I'm like, well, to answer that, I need to get a little like philosophical, <laughs> right? So I think space is vastly more terrifying. Mm -hmm. It is infinite and unknown and expanding with more concepts of billions of galaxies and stars than I can really wrap my brain around. So I think that in itself is like a little more scary, mm -hmm. right? But the ocean's right there. Like I can go and in, in five minutes walk, get up from where I'm sitting now and be in the ocean. And I know that there are lots of things in there. Like the space is an, space is an unknown scary. Mm-hmm. The ocean's like a known, I know sharks, I know whales, I know. But it's still unknown. But it's like, but it's still unknown, but it's touchable. Mm -hmm. It's there. Not only is it there, but it's been there before we yeah. were even here. So like these people, these ship captains are sailing, like I can go out to the Salem Harbor and be like, and just close my eyes and imagine all these people making these crossings from, you know, not only from England, but from Africa and all around. And they are seeing <laughs> penguins. Um but uh, whales and narwhals and and they don't even know squids and like the wrecks and the ruins. I was gonna say you've got those incredible sights, but then you also have the terrifying moments: ships not coming back, ships being lost yeah, at sea, yeah. the unpredictability of the ocean. So that is to me way scarier. Oh yeah, because it's right there, and it's like I can I can look. How many people have died in space? Probably like zero, right? Like humans who have died in space. I, I don't want to say zero. I mean, it was the, the tragedy of, of the Challenger. Uh -huh. I don't think that was technically in space yet. How many humans have died at sea? Tens of thousands. Places. <laughs> Although I like to go swimming in it. And I like to go scuba diving in it. And I like sharks and turtles and coral. Have you, You've seen Black Sails, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember the episode where they lose wind? Yes. And they are just stranded out there. And you just have to wait for it to come back. Yeah. Surrounded by salt water that you can't drink. <laughs> so terrifying. And human beings are like, yeah, let's go do that. No, but see, that's the thing. It's like, I think we look back and see it as a, oh, I'm going to sea, sea shanties, right? So exciting. But when you actually like pull apart the lyrics of those things, like it's terrifying when you really, really look at what it took to go out. To yeah, a place yeah. that you don't know. So Elias will go on to marry Elizabeth Crowninshield in 1761 at the age of 24. And we should know if you ever do wander through Salem's uh, prominent families, you are going to see the same names over and over and over and over again because they all like to keep it in the family. So Interestingly enough, he marries Elizabeth Crowninshield, but his sister, Mary Derby, marries George Crowninshield, Elizabeth's brother. So what what is that? That makes you a like a double in-law? So, so I guess. Double in-law, right? So I, w I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so if me and... My sister. Actually, no, I don't think it's that weird. Well, I guess, but if me and my sister both marry, so I marry siblings. Siblings. So we both marry siblings. So my, I have a sister in law. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I have a wife and a brother in law. But that brother in law is also my sister's husband. Yes, right there. Okay, so then our, I guess it doesn't change the kids. The kids are all cousins they'd still all be cousins regardless <laughs> it's still it's i got one 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 way to one up that okay i worked for a man who was a twin and he they married a set of twins 
identical? Yeah. Okay. So their kids are both cousins and genetic siblings. Yeah. Genetic siblings? Yeah. Is that like a thing? Because they're both identical, then they're... Yeah, if, if they were fraternal, it wouldn't be. But since they're they're identical, right? So man and woman uh-huh. are identical. They have a kid, uh-huh. right? So genetically, that kid's 50-50 of each of that person. If they, ha- if they are both twins, so those two people have the same genetic markers as the other two people, and they have a kid, then that kid is the same as a sib- genetically a, a sibling and also technically a cousin. Hmm. I'm not going to argue with you because I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) It sounds sound. Identical twins. Science lesson again. (laughs) Fraternal twins are arguably more weird, but like less visually um, because it's a genetic thing. Identical twins are a mistake, right? Like it just splits. Right, right. right. Um, But like a fraternal twin is the woman's releasing two eggs. So they're like brothers. Oh, yeah, you're a twin. I was no, like, no, no, how no, 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 no. I, Or no, sorry, you're not a... My brothers are twins. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I yeah. was like, how do you know so much yeah. about twins? Yeah, and it's genetic. So my aunts are twins, My or my mom's... Uh, my mom's aunts are twins. Her kids are twins. My cousin has twins. So it's it's all like, yeah, fraternal twins are, are a genetic uh, an anomaly. Identical twins is just a fluke. Gotcha. Science. And now, right? (laughs) Elias and Elizabeth will go on to have eight children, three daughters, five sons, all but one. The second youngest, Henry, will go on to live pretty long lives, which is surprising given the... Statistically, uh, that's not... Yeah. Right. But given their status... I mean, even still, like sometimes you just have... True, true. ...a plague or a sickness... Even, you know, well-off families get hit with smallpox and things like that, so. Very true. At this point, Salem is experiencing growth with the rest of the colonies. They are engaging in international trade, and it's becoming a successful port city. And his family is going to be operating right at the center of it. Which is then forcing him and his family, I'd say forcing, um, they are then involved in the conflict with the English. Right. So think about the colony at this point is over 100 years old. We've got several generations that have been here. They've been establishing a new identity. They're growing more and more dissatisfied with British rule. Damn it, King George. He is going to be existing and growing up in this type of environment. Yeah. And especially as a merchant, that's a a heavy duty thing, right? That's where a lot of uh, the economy and the value is coming from here, right? Mm -hmm. Like taxation without representation and the Boston Boston Tea Tea Party Party and and these things. So he's involved with all of these other players and these other narratives. He's 37 years old when the Revolutionary War kicks off. Uh, So he sees not only like as a young man growing up, but then like now as, as getting and, and, and having to lay the foundation for his own family and future, what this involved in. He's involved in uh, the conflict of the American Revolution in his own right. He becomes a privateer. Remember, it's basically legal pirating. You get to go out with your ship, capture British soldiers, British ship. sailors, uh, hold them for ransom, take their cargo as your own, right. sell it, make money and do the whole process all so, over so like, again. Kind of imagine today, right? You go out in like your SUV and pull over a UPS truck and like take the Give truck. me your stuff. Give me your stuff. Yeah. And then you take the driver and then you contact UPS. You're like, if you want any of your stuff back, you're going to have to give me all the money. That's, and it works. And it works. And it works. And it's extremely profitable. So, this is where he makes the basis of his money. And uh, he's tied a lot to, I mean, there's a lot of ships that he owns, um, but he's tied a lot to one specific ship. So I read at the start of the revolution, he had about seven ships Mm -hmm. under him, uh, but he does play a crucial role in equipping and kind of rallying people of Salem to go out and take part in this privateering. So I saw about 150, 158 158. ships. 158. So that's what he's 
like got a stake in right or like supporting or arming or providing manpower or yeah you don't have to own you don't have to own the entire ship but if you it's like stocks right you buy a stock of a ship it goes out and you get a portion of that proceed so he's using like that family money that he's garnished and taking a direct involvement in the revolutionary war by arming and and financing all these ships but one ship in particular that stands out (gasps) Dun, dun, dun. The Grand Turk. So the Grand Turk is one of the most infamous ships, uh, not only during the Revolutionary War, but afterwards. And it, it has a lot, of, uh, a lot of stories tied to it. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of those. Um, so do you want to start where the Grand Turk starts? Do we want to start with the fact that everyone has seen it? Everyone has seen it. Everyone I, has seen it. I'm not going to make a significant wager, but I'll make a small wager that all of you have seen the Grand Turk. The Old Spice logo. If you've seen an Old Spice commercial, if you have a thing of Old Spice, go check out the little ship. That's the Grand Turk. And we covered some of this before. Uh, we're getting a little more detail. So the Grand Turk uh, was originally built in 1781. And fun fact, um, he didn't really pay for, I mean, he paid for it. But he didn't pay with cash. It was for barter. So the shipmaster, he was like, yeah, I'll give you butter and salt if you build me a ship. Which is how sure something, was, yeah, a lot of butter and salt, <laughs> <laughs> right? Like tons and tons, right. of, and it wasn't just that. But uh, so I've always found that interesting. Is like this huge, expansive ship with all the labor, all the manpower, all the paint, the, the the tar, the ropes, the ships, the mast, all came from the barter of product. But you got to think what these, what kind of economic system these folks are operating in within that time. You go to a different port. You're not necessarily going to exchange goods for money. It's goods for goods at various different points. So for them, cash, coinage, very similar to actual products. Which is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. So he gets the Grand Turk, and he it is uh, maybe the most prominent player in the role of his privateering days. It's quick, it's fast, but it's also pretty large. It's a 300-ton ship with 28 guns, so 28 cannons on board. I, I feel like you can make a little song about that, 300 tons with 28 guns. It's 20, got a nice little... 300 tons, 28 guns. It's got a nice little... Right? <laughs> Good old Derby coming into Salem. <laughs> he was here. He never laughed. Oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Shoot. His, his son, though. His son. His son. Derby go. Jr. coming in Salem. <laughs> so, but, oh, I and love it. real quick, just for comparison, we talked uh, quite a bit about the friendship, and you mm-hmm. can actually go see a replica of the friendship in Salem Harbor. That is a 342-ton vessel. So relatively of similar size that will be built just 15 years later. So it's about the same size, a little smaller, which again makes it a little sleeker. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this uh, majestic beauty of the waves manages to capture. Is that a direct quote? No, <laughs> I just I just made that up. Yeah, I don't nice. know where that came from. Um, may, I don't know. Probably some like we secret. could put it in the song. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, I got this. Right. Um, this majestic beauty of the waves takes twenty five British ships, which is. A lot. A lot. A lot. I, can you imagine this one ship? It just rolls up on you again, and there it goes. And might I say badass? Yeah. Because we're dealing with the British Navy here. The Royal Navy. And these are, and we give a lot of credit to the um, revolutionaries on. On the ground. One if by land, two if by sea. You know, on George the Washington, yeah. right? That's what you and think of. These armies and these just colonial men from their homes. um, going out and fighting, but the amount of men that must have crewed these ships um, numbered in the thousands mm-hmm. from Salem, and and these guys are risking it all on the high seas to go fight the largest navy in the world. Uh, it's, again, just one, I think... It's so cool. Yeah, during the Revolutionary War, we tend not to talk about the, the, the sea battles and whatnot a lot, but this is a prime example of how these small merchants took their fortune, took their wealth and and their property, their ships, crewed them with people, armed them, and sent them out to get the Royal Navy. And then would come back with enough to finance future ventures or just settle down. 
The revolution is going to come to an end on September 3rd, 1783, with the signing of the Treaty of Paris. And fun fact, it's actually one of Derby's ships that comes back with word of peace Okay, from France. I like it. A ship called Estrella. So once the war is over, what do these privateers do? So as the country transitions into a peacetime, Derby has to adapt his fleet, along with, of course, everyone else here in Salem, and starts using those ships to trade, once again, internationally. But because of all this war, the ships have only gotten larger and larger. So you're going to see an even further increase in that trade. And not to mention, we are no longer under the thumb of Britain. So they can do with it what they will. Go where they want. Trade with whom they mm -hmm. want. Trade under an American flag. So it's in 1784 that the Grand Turk makes its first voyage to China. So that is the first voyage of any ship under an American flag to make it that far. Yeah, which is kind of cool. And uh, what's our city motto again? To the farthest port of the rich east. That's where they're going. We're, we've stuck by that. And remember, it is Derby's Grand Turk that is on the city. Nope, never mind. Is it? In the background? Yeah. Ooh, I don't think. So. What is it? Why What's wouldn't it be? It doesn't say. Mm. Could be, could be. So, interestingly, that first trip, the that first 1784 voyage of the Grand Turk around the Cape of Good Hope, we don't have any actual record of. Um, which, which is unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, but also not uncommon. No. We do have a lot of references of a lot of different ships that were sent out by Derby uh, to all these ports, uh, not only around... Africa to China and India and whatnot, but he made some other journeys as well. He actually made it all the way to St. Petersburg, Russia. So, so that's like 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 the put yourself in like his position. They've never gone to these places. Like it's kind of really wild. He was not only a successful entrepreneur because of the money he took from these privateering fleets, but at the same time, he made a lot of bold business decisions that, you know, at this moment in time, can you imagine just like picking up and it's like, I'm going to go to Antarctica. I mean, I know that's a ridiculous <laughs> comparison, but like, seriously, like it's, it's so, so, so he, foreign. Yeah. I mean, none of them ships and it's like today there's obviously risk in business, you know, but the risk of like, I'm going to take a ship, I'm going to crew it. I'm going to man it. Uh, sometimes with my family, we're going to talk about a son in, in a few minutes uh, and send that over. And then you just, so, okay. Fun fact. We sometimes think that, they then have no idea what's going on, but they did. Well, like, yeah, of course. You send letters back. You send letters back. So Derby would get, like, updates. But here's the thing is there's nothing he could really do about it. And not, it's like, hey, we're in calling in this port. He's not going to get those letters for, like, three Month. months, four you months. To, you have to trust your crew. You have to trust your captain. Yeah. And I actually read that he was very good at selecting individuals, I mean, he must have been, right? To if have you're the gonna, success he did. Right? If you're going to man it all from home mm -hmm. and hope that your, I think I saw that his voyages numbered over 300 total. I mean, he ended up employing over 100 captains over the course of his business. That, I mean. You got to pick the right guy for the right gotta job. Got to pick the right guy. And that's And then that person then has to have the trust of his crew. And it just, it must have been. Absolutely fantastic endeavor, but again, he, he's wildly successful. I wonder how stressed out he was. Or maybe he was one of those guys that kind of just let everything just brush right off. He could, he could just handle it. He could just roll with the punches. Uh, so it's pretty fascinating to try and picture what Derby must have looked like. Actually, hold on. That brings me to a, a good point. Hmm. What Derby looked like. Oh, yes. He's he, got such a unique characteristic here. <laughs> he has uh, something called heterochromia. So you got two different color eyes. Yes. So he has, I think, one's brown and one's blue. There's a very famous portrait of him that's done after his death, and it is very distinctly there, the two different color eyes. You also notice that he's sitting in an office working on some charts and looking at some, some drawings. And in the background, out the window, you've got the ocean and what could be the Grand Turk. Uh, the famous ship. So... He's making all this money. He's doing um, all this stuff. But before I get into uh, 
some Cape of Good Hope stuff. You want to talk, uh, you mentioned St. Petersburg? Yes. So this is a voyage that starts in June of 1784, just like I believe their Canton voyage mm-hmm. to China. Never been done before, but it opens up trade with St. Petersburg. And shortly thereafter, you'll see ships coming from Russia into okay. Boston Harbor uh, just years later. So we know what we get from the east, right? We've talked pepper and spice. What's what's up in St. Petersburg? So they're looking to pull in... Ice? <laughs> <laughs> the biggest imports, we've got hemp, okay, iron. Iron? Yes. And a thing called duck, which was actually... Uh, Not like... Not like ducks, okay. which I initially thought like they're just unloading ships just, full just of ducks full. from <laughs> Russian ducks. <laughs> but um, it's actually, it's a term that was uh, used for a, tip, a specific type of cloth okay. that was most often used for uh, making sails for ships. Oh, it's like that heavy duck cloth. I know what that duck is. Duck cloth, yeah. Yeah. No vodka? No vodka. Oh. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure that comes later. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I can only imagine. Oh, and I should mention too, the... Iron that was coming yeah. from St. Petersburg, that would end up being kind of like the catalyst behind nail making. Like we're talking like modern day mm-hmm. nails, mm-hmm. right? That really explodes in the 1790s and it ends up propelling like the carpentry field forward and helping them build more efficiently and more sturdily. Yeah, super okay. interesting. That makes sense. I know there's some buildings even in town that are still just built with like wooden pegs and stuff Mm -hmm. uh definitely which i'm sure they still did but this was like a huge innovation that's crazy once the first machine was created to make the nails there was like 20 something patents that were issued within the first 10 or 15 years of it just bettering that equipment and that's that's jump that's now we're getting to the industrial revolution yeah that makes sense absolutely and i can only imagine what a, a trip that must have been cold must have been freezing. I guess they, they probably went in the summer months, but that's still probably pretty chilly. Yeah. Oof. No thanks. I'd rather go down around the Cape of Good Hope in Africa. I mean. I uh, uh, eh. I don't think I would. <laughs> okay. I guess that's a bit of a toss up because that's a, a tumultuous. Extremely where, dangerous. Where the Indian and the Atlantic Oceans literally crash into each other, I guess, is uh, can be pretty dangerous. It still is to this yeah, day. Yeah, to this day. Um, but Elias Haskett Derby junior so his son uh makes this trip and we have an expansive record of his trip aboard the grand turk there we go so this is the one we got a lot of good record for um and he sails down there um and he writes back to his dad like a lot uh everything from uh, how the weather was to how he wants his grandmother's cheese uh, <laughs> to, to how the trading conditions are to um, he needs new clothes at one point. I guess it gained a little weight. He gained a little weight. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess maybe he got his grandmother's cheese and then, then needed clothes right? after the fact. <laughs> I, I don't actually know the timeline it's just, on that. It's odd to request something like that when, of course, you could just get new clothes. Yeah, like, but, but they probably didn't make like good English Right, 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 right. Caught whatever the you know he's a well-off merchant. He needs to look. He can afford it a certain way, and I'm guessing in the island of France they probably weren't making that sort of clothing. Although that then begs the question: that's probably a missed business opportunity if no one's making the kind of clothes that all the men in port need. That's speculation. I don't actually know. As I say, it's probably a lot easier now to open up like a yeah, business yeah. to fill a void like that than it was back then but if you're bringing cotton and stuff back to <laughs> to the americas or to, to europe from these places and then these men who are in those places then need to get the shirts that are being made from the cotton in france back i feel like there might have been an easier an way. easier way right yeah yeah, yeah. yeah that's so what I'm saying anyway derby uh makes this voyage we have a some a lot of great records of what he does, how he's received in these ports. Uh, I think one of the most interesting thing is he's seen favorably in some ports and not in others. Uh, so that like he himself, yeah, or yeah. Derby okay. Junior. So he has to sort of he's representing his dad's company, right? Right. And I guess at one point, um, pretty much like one tenth of all the ships in any of these ports were owned by his dad. 
So you're going, I mean, you show up somewhere, they know the Derby name. Yeah. Yeah. So they either like you or they don't like you. Do you have good cargo? Do you have the good ship captains? The reputation matters. Uh, Like we talked about, like choosing these men, is is that the right guy for the job? Mm -hmm. Is he going to go into some port in in India and cause a ruckus? That's that's bad for business. Um, So he makes these great business connections, whatever else. I think, in my opinion, one of the most fascinating things that he does is he sells the Grand Turk. You find it fascinating. Yes. I find it just kind of like, I don't know, just a normal business decision. In retrospect, we all say, you know, hindsight is yeah. twenty twenty. Like we look at the Grand Turk as like this, this huge vessel, the head of his successful privateering fleet, captured 25 British ships, could possibly be the ship that is featured in the Salem City Seal, could possibly be the ship that's featured in Elias's most famous portrait. Mm-hmm. But, and of course it's on all the old Spice logos, but, you know, this is just a boat to him. It's a, <sighs> dare I say, it's but a, the dude had... It's a valuable commodity. Must have had like, uh, you know, dozens of ships at that point. But that's like, that's like the one, I don't know. Like I, I, know, I get personally. It. So uh, he sells it for um, $13,000. It's a good chunk of change. Yeah, back then, absolutely. And then he buys a ship for $8,000 to replace it, and it's just bigger. So then he can fill it with even more stuff. And I, you're so right. Like, I know it's a good business decision, but just yeah, like. Yeah, like it's not. From like a historical, and he doesn't have the historical point of view. And I guess if you come into port in like a, Ferrari is the wrong word. But like, oh, this sleek, you know, sort of warship. And then you're like, oh, I can just get a big cargo ship. And come back with a boatload of stuff, yeah, literally. Yeah, I know. I'm telling you, I, I genuinely think this dude must, and, and and Derby himself never even went out on the boat. Like, I doubt this guy had any emotional, sentimental ties to this thing. And yet somehow we do. If that goes, <laughs> if that tells you how people assign meaning to things in history yeah, like we yeah. are very much the creators of our own story and it's why some things stick out when you look back hundreds and hundreds of years later and some things don't yeah uh, okay either way s- sentimentality attached to it I, I think that then sure that makes the story even better right that like the ship that we're all attached to the sun is just like yeah no mate we're and then dead. i don't think we know what happens to it after that i tried right? Like, so there are some other ships named the Grand Turk. Obviously, the islands, the Grand Turks and Caicos. Um, there was a battleship, uh, an English warship in the late 1800s named the Grand Turk. So when you try and find out what happened to the ship this guy sold. The other ones come up. Yeah, yeah. But okay. so he sells that. He continues his um, seafaring jobs. And then he returns uh, He returns to Salem. You know, a, a wealthy man and, and has done his dad proud. Can you imagine sending out a child to the other side of the... I mean, people do it nowadays, but we have cell phones. We have the internet. You, you can, can get into contact with yeah, them if you need to. You can micromanage the business. He's sending, by the way, by the way, I don't think I mentioned this, Elias Hasker Derby Jr., <laughs> he's 22. 22 years old when he is sent out. On the Grand Turk, go for it. Like, I don't know. That's crazy. Makes me feel... Right? insufficient <laughs> <laughs> it's like the the amount of uh responsibility the trust his dad must have had in him and he must have it yeah the whole thing is just a little wild mm-hmm. the times obviously you know the times are different times yeah but just to think about all of that how it's all coming together to me is is one of one of the coolest things about this whole derby story so the business continues to prosper he had successfully taken that wealth made from privateering during the revolution and turned it into even more money through dominating the global trade. By the 1790s, a third of all Salem ships to round the Cape of Good Hope were his. And a fifth of all American ships to visit the Isle of France were his. That's that's like, it's insane. So if they're, that's ridiculous. That's a lot. 
it's a lot. <laughs> so by this point, he's in his 50s and he's looking towards retirement. Yeah, he, he's got... He's trained his children to go out and, and perform the businesses for him. He's got all that money, which by the way, we mentioned he's the first millionaire. Um, that's probably about, about $20, $30 million in today's wealth. Yeah, so yeah, compared to... To nowadays, you know, we've got billionaires yeah, yeah. Uh, multiple times over. But it's still a lot of money. Still a lot of money. But seeing as he has all this wealth and all this money, he wants to live a luxurious, 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 luxurious lifestyle. So what does he do? Builds the biggest damn mansion Salem had ever seen. Yeah. Anyone want to see it? Sorry. It's gone. Gone. It lasted like 15 years. Yeah, barely. <laughs> right? Okay, so. And I don't even think it was lived in for the last 10 years of it yeah, or so. I, I think. I don't think anyone maintained it. Derby and his, Elias Haskett Derby and his wife live in it for about a Elizabeth year. Elizabeth Cronenshield. Elizabeth let's, Cronenshield. Let's not forget the wife's name. I'm sure almost all of you listening know of the old town hall that is in today. What is Derby Square? So if you are standing on Essex Street looking down at that Hocus Pocus filming location, mm-hmm. we'll talk about that too. Don't worry. we got a whole episode about that. Um, I want to take you back to 1799, okay? Ooh. That building is twice again as big. So if you cut it in half and took those two ends, add it together, right? So it's a huge mansion, four large chimneys on either side, a dome in the middle. Two carriage houses to flank either side. Imagine what you see today and where this is. So do away with uh, Wicked Good Books. Do away with Count Orlock's Nightmare Gallery. Those are where those big carriage houses are. That's like right dead in the center of Salem. Now, let's flip it. Let's get a view from the other side. Back at this point, this Old South River was actually still a full-blown river. Mm-hmm. And if... You look at these images of the home, you'll see he's got one face of the house right up against the water. Yeah. And there are ships outside. I mean, it's a, it's a bustling. He is right there in the heart of it. He can overlook his ships. His, he can see his he empire. can see his empire yeah. right from his second story window, probably from his first story window. <laughs> Imagine in that back area, they've got beautiful Federalist style gardens. Mm-hmm. They also have a what they call a summer house, which you can still see as much as the the mansion is no longer, that summer house still remains. We moved it, right? We did yeah. move it. We moved it. So basically, it's a it's very similar size to a carriage house. I would say even smaller. And it was a little gathering place for folks during the summertime. A small one room kind of little cottage style that would accommodate just a table, chairs, and you'd sit and have lunch, tea, and overlook the gardens and the old South River. So what I think is picturesque. Um, one of the best things about what you've just described, and I want to try and have everyone hold that in their mind. And then for those of you, again, who've been here, think about when you come here in the summer and you stand on the other side of the old town hall and there's all those little chairs outside <gasps> and there's people sitting there every day. It's like you were... Eating their ice cream, having their coffee. It's the exact same thing. <laughs> Definitely not nearly as luxurious. But it's funny because we love it. We appreciate it. But just imagine what was go, standing go, there. Go get some ice cream and then sit there and... <gasps> But back then, that would have been waterfront. Front Street was the water. You would have been overlooking the harbor. Maybe there was a ship there. So before we we wrap up this imagery of the Derby House, um, what I want to sort of tie in is some of the other things that you would have been able to see if you were either the Derby House itself, so the other buildings that exist at the time, or if you had been wandering around the property. And things that you can actually still see today. So Cassie, who messaged us earlier about wanting to stay in the Merchant, the Merchant was built in 1784. So that predates the Derby Mansion. So if you were standing, say, up on like the Widow's Watch of the Merchant Hotel, you could Look, like wave to, to whoever was. Derby, yeah. Have, yeah. Um, and then the 1805 Customs House on Central Street, 1805. So those buildings exist at the same time. Uh, Derby was already dead. But then the Deal Marcus building, 11 Central Street, which we talked about, was a bank. So if in 1811, when that bank was done, you could have had a ship come in to what is now Artist Row, which would have been in the water, and have someone at the Derby house, and you could have taken 
your wares up to the customs house and then brought your money over to the bank. And all of those things still stand. Yeah. Except. Except. Probably. <laughs> no offense to the Deal Marcus building and no offense to the 1804 Customs House, but that mansion Probably would have been, been uh, a gem. And no offense to the old town hall. Yeah. That becomes a beautiful marketplace and people still love it. So interestingly that that is a marketplace. Yeah. So let's talk about the end of that mansion. Okay. It doesn't last for long because, unfortunately, good old Derby croaks. Yeah. Poor guy builds this incredible empire, has amassed all this wealth, has this huge mansion constructed for him and his wife so he can then enjoy it, oversee the operations. His family is now taking it over. And just a couple years later, he dies. 1799. That mansion is finished in 1799, and he dies in 1799. So they probably lived in it for maybe a year. Um, she also dies in 1799 as well. Before him, like yep. three, four months before him. Maybe that's why he dies. He dies at 60 years old, yeah. which still astounds me. Young. Very young. Maybe it was the stress. Maybe. Could be. We could only hope if Jeff Bezos <laughs> croaks this early <laughs> Oh, uh, man. So Elias Haskett Derby passes away on September 9th, 1799. Less than a month after celebrating his 60th birthday. Oof. And missing the turn of the century. Yeah. Yeah. Missed the 1800s. He was, I mean, imagine he was setting himself up yeah. for a very long, lovely retirement. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> um, he dies. The the wealth. So okay, it's everything is complicated. History is complicated, but the shipping industry is always up and down. And while it was up in Derby's life, after he dies, it takes a dip. Uh, a few reasons, I would say, first and foremost of which is the War of eighteen twelve. Um, and some trade embargoes. Yeah, specifically the trade embargo of 1807. It slashes the amount of money that is being brought into the city, yeah. brought into the country, yeah. really, at yeah. that point. Uh, so significantly that, you know, we don't we don't have a prosperous Derby family residing around the states now. I mean, the the name itself, the fortune, it all slowly starts to dwindle away. So when Derby does die and those that mansion is left vacant, it ends up being passed on, of course, to his children. Derby Jr. But unfortunately, he is not able to keep up with the expenses, and it is leveled in 1815. The land is then given over to the city of Salem. So with that sale, uh, it's also deeded by the Derbies and uh, a Mr. Pickman, who's another prominent uh, merchant in Salem, that this land is going to be used as a fish market. Um, they also deed some land that then goes down to the wharf. So literally right there on, on Front Street, uh, all this area now, yes, is city property under the condition that they keep it as a central market, uh, which is pretty cool. And which we still, we still see the remnants of today. So if any of you have been here, uh, we've, we, the uh, arts fair is coming up. So that's you have outdoor arts markets. Our farmer's market is there. Uh, Christmas markets are in the town hall. Uh, antique markets, flea markets, vendors, all of these things exist in Derby Square because of that reason. Thank goodness they didn't keep it a fish market. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, I love fish, but yeah. like. I don't know. Maybe like a high-end sushi place would take. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't think that's what okay, they meant by you know it. What? I don't think that's what they meant by it. <laughs> I can I just hope. say it would be a little smelly. I, but. It probably would be. It was probably pretty smelly back then. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All of it was probably pretty Every smelly. <laughs> when that tide goes down, I tell you. Like, even today, you're like, oof. Back then, it must have been... Which, although I've heard that that's one of the reasons that um, Chestnut Street was, was founded and built. A lot of because these, of the smell. Yeah, a lot of the wealthy merchants wanted away from the stench of the ocean. My neighborhood. Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> Those uh, wealthy Salemites. Um, so that, that building is torn down. The town hall is built. And uh, we have Derby Square today. And 
I think that just about rounds out his life. Yeah. But we can talk a little bit about what you can see here in town if you are interested, because there is a bit of that legacy still left over. Of course, we can say that he is in part responsible for a lot of Salem's early success and wealth. Say he had never helped man and equip those ships yeah, just during the revolution. If he'd, been, uh, if he'd been a, for some reason, been a loyalist, mm-hmm. all of that, those arms, those ships, that ammunition, those crew, that would have never happened. So it's interesting to think about. Yeah. So 1799, interestingly enough, is also the same year that the, well, as we know it today, the Peabody Essex Museum, the East India Company, the East India Marine Hall opens. Um, and on display in there, if anyone's coming to Salem, uh, you can go see a portrait of Elias Haskett Derby. And that's maybe the first place. I can't recall. You can see that he has heterochromia, like distinctly right. in the portrait. Um, and that might have, like I was looking, and I'm like, his eyes are different colors. <laughs> like, and like you're looking at me like, what the heck? And then a little bit of research from there and you find out. We will be throwing up a copy of that portrait yes. online, but you can easily pop right on over to the Peabody yeah. Essex Museum website. A lot of people seem to forget that, that the PEM is like... There. I'm honestly surprised they didn't name it after him. <laughs> <laughs> the Derby Museum. Right? It's the, like there's yeah, Derby yeah. everywhere. Yeah. So a couple places that you can check out if you are strolling through Salem. Upon doing this research, we actually stumbled on Derby's birthplace. Yeah. Which, which was crazy because they don't have a sign out front. Yeah, a lot of, so I'm sure many of you have noticed walking through the city, we have these little historic plaques. They look like little houses. Yeah, usually. On on a lot of buildings, and they'll say the name, either the the date the building was built, founded, lived in. Who it was built for, what what occupation they they maintained. Or if it was a prominent person. So it might have been built, and then 50 years later, a prominent person lived there. And they'll include that. They'll include that. Exactly. Uh, If you take Essex Street down past the witch house, past the ropes mansion, past the Salem library. So it is a bit far down on your way to Proctor's ledge and that second Salem witch trials memorial. You will pass on your left hand side, uh, his birthplace. It's an indiscriminate white house. 393 Essex Street. It's, It's an unassuming white house. You wouldn't even know his name adorns our streets and our squares, but you don't see it anywhere on this house. That is the birthplace of King Derby. But more to Salem Center, if you are in the wharf area, so of course we have Derby Wharf, you're able to walk out to the lighthouse, but on Derby Street, we also have a home still standing called the Derby House. It's one of the oldest brick homes here in Salem. It was built as a wedding present for Elias Haskett Derby and his wife, Elizabeth, that and they the, lived in it for 20 years with their be, children. Here's this, it's not giant, I say that. It's no, a, but it's a nice it's house. A nice brick house, like wedding if, present. If anyone gifted me that, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, that's a nice, yeah. that's a nice house. But is, and I'm so thankful that we still have it today because even though we don't have the mansion itself, we at least have his earlier home. And I think maybe perhaps a lot of that was because it was eventually sold off and someone else took it over. So perhaps if it stayed in the Derby family, they might have, they may not, it yeah. may not exist today. It is currently part of the Salem Maritime National Historic Site, which we did talk about quite a bit. I don't believe it's open to the public, but you can pop around the back and kind of bask in the gardens you've, back you've there. You've mentioned those gardens before. Yes, the gardens are beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. So you, if anything, that gives you a sense of what it was like. What what the gardens in the front of the yes. mansion may have looked like. Mm-hmm. Oh, and speaking of gardens, uh, don't forget you can go see the summer house, the Derby BB summer house that was part of the original mansion. So th- if anything, yep. that is the last little bit of the mansion that still exists. And that is located as part of the historic Essex block neighborhood of the Peabody Essex Museum. So it is owned by them, maintained by them, kind of tucked away, and it is set in front of some Federalist-style gardens. So if you go up to those steps, have a little seat, look out over the garden, you might get a little bit of a sense of what they were experiencing. Yeah. No South River, unfortunately. You actually have <laughs> you actually have a really good view of the back window that the murderers... <laughs> 
went in <laughs> through to go kill Captain White, <laughs> which you, we mentioned the clue murder at the beginning of this episode. So you, but, you could you could go there, sit there, uh, get a shell and listen to the ocean and get some rotting fish and you'd be like... <laughs> then it might be more yeah, authentic. Yeah, <laughs> if you want that real authentic. Show up the bucket. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> If you show up with a bucket of rotting fish on one of the PEMS historic lands, you know, just trying to relive I, the I, experience. I'm here for history, okay? It's for history. <laughs> so oh, funny. I don't know if I want people to do that or not. <laughs> okay. Oh, and also one last fun fact, another location that you can visit. There are actually two summer houses. I don't know why I'm so obsessed with these little things. I feel like it's the original version of glamping <laughs> you know so over in danvers at the glen magna farm there is a once again carved by samuel mcintyre a 20 foot by 20 foot two and a half story white summer I feel house like that's gotta be like twice the size of the one by the pam I think it's sub- not substantially larger, but a bit larger. I just don't feel like that one is twenty feet by twenty feet. I think it's I think it's like fifteen by fifteen. Oh. I would that's what I would venture to guess. Okay, but the one by the PEM is not two and a half stories high. No, it's so this one. one's super super cool. Right. It's you only like, one floor. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can like peer right into the yeah. windows, but this one you have to walk up and you are kind of overlooking whatever gardens it would have been situated in. So originally it was located where the North Shore Mall is now. That's where the Derby family had a kind of like a, a, a farm. That would have been nice. That's like, that's that's on a hill. Right? Mm-hmm. So it's called, it was called Oak Hills. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There, there we go. There you go. You If you stand down by the Liberty Tree Mall, which for those of you who are locals, like where the Target movie theater is, uh-huh. you can see like up to the, the North Shore Mall. Yeah. Um, they have that big new fitness center there, which like takes up a lot of space. But you can definitely see how that would have been. You know, if that was farmland, that, that would have been gorgeous. And sprawling yeah, hills. Yeah. Absolutely. I did stumble upon a description of what it was like being in one of these summer houses. It's pulled from a young woman's diary, and she is specifically talking about visiting the Derby Farm. She says, The air from the windows is always pure and cool, and the eye wanders with delight over the beautiful landscape below. The room is ornamented with some Chinese figures and seems calculated for serenity and peace. I want a summer house now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jeffrey, buy me a summer house. Yeah, uh, let me put that on the list. <laughs> I got you. Um. <laughs> so interesting note about the family that kind of ties into the summer house. The oldest daughter, Elizabeth. So mm-hmm. she's named for her mother, Elizabeth okay. Crown and Shield. She's going to inherit that farm in the early 1800s. No, that's a good bit of, that's a nice inheritance. I mean, I think she wanted the mansion, first and <laughs> foremost. Uh, from what I read, she was a bit of a socialite. Think about her position in society. Did, have you ever seen Hamilton? Yes. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> you I, I, just gave me the worst look. Okay, I should have I should have known. Okay, Hamilton. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have never gotten the opportunity to go see it. I've only watched it on, like, Disney. <laughs> So, okay, you've seen Hamilton. So the Schuyler sisters and Angelica, yeah, yeah. she's like, she's in that position where she has to go out and marry someone high. Oh, and it's, it's the same time frame. Same time, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and same environment too, yeah. like the revolution happening around yeah. them. So she probably would have been expected to marry a high status gentleman. But instead, she falls in love with a sea captain, oh, one, that, one that happens to be working under her father. Okay, tell me that's not like a like a perfect uh, rom com is the wrong word. <laughs> no, hundred percent. But like, like that would make a great movie, right? Like she's the rich family, the uh-huh. seafaring merchants, and then you know, all of a sudden, I feel like it's one of those like like Christmas movies, <laughs> you know, Hallmark, the Hallmark <laughs> movies. Like I can just picture her. I'm sorry. I can just picture her like, you know, walking with her dad, like down Derby Wharf one day talking about like marriage things. And she like catches the eye of this like shirtless sailor. Like, uh, 
right? You just made him shirtless. <laughs> of course, <laughs> right? Like the, the the Salem wind in his hair unloading <laughs> these boxes of cargo. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, no. So and she's only 21 at the time. Okay. 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 No. Get, basically, that's what happened. She elopes. She sees this guy. She and they sees like, this there's guy. There's the moment. And they sing a song and they fall in love. Yeah. <laughs> she elopes with this guy named Nathaniel West. He's this broading sea captain working See? under her father. And... Elias isn't the biggest fan, of course. You know, she's definitely marrying under her status. But he warms up to the idea, kind of brings him further into the business, and actually ends up making him an heir to some of his fortune. So fast forward to Elias dying in 1799. Uh That money is going to be split up. Oldest son ends up inheriting the mansion, uh, Elizabeth and Nathaniel end up inheriting the farm and the money is, you know, split up. But Nathaniel still maintains a relatively active role in the family business, but runs into issues along the way. He and Elizabeth are experiencing like marital spats, of course, of you course. You know what it is. What? It's the tunnels. He's hanging out with <laughs> all the prostitutes. and That's, doing- <laughs> well... Spoiler alert, that's basically <laughs> what's going on, minus the tunnels. And no, he's, no, it's, it's the tunnels. It's the, yeah, <laughs> and the opium. Right, exactly. See? Also gets in fights with the Derby boys. There's a report of a fist fight on the Salem docks Ooh. between one of the Derby sons and Nathaniel. So not See, seeing eye to eye. Great mo- Netflix, this is ours. Don't right? even. Don't keep your hands off of it. I'm going to use that little intro music that I created at the beginning of this episode, and we can. (laughs) Oh, good Lord. (laughs) So they end up separating in 1803. Is that even legal? Yeah, I was going to say, to put that into context, roughly like one a year you're looking at for the century leading up to that. Uh, And and that includes divorces, separations, annulments. It was very, very rare. And I think her status had a lot to do with that. She was allowed. She was, yeah, she had a little bit of pull. So then things heat up. We throw out the D word. Divorce. Yes. So up until 1806, if you were to pursue divorce against your husband, you were only entitled to one third a share of his total estate. So very limited. But after 1806, that law changes and you are entitled to things that maybe were under your name already, property, lands, money that you had inherited like she had inherited from her father. Only though, if you can prove adultery (gasps) dun 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 hold on do we have a dun 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 button no not yet (laughs) not that's not the vibe not the vibe (laughs) so she files for divorce and it becomes quite the scandal played out right in salem courts and she actually went as far to bring in sex workers to the courtroom. She did what? She yeah. Okay, so I knew about the there were the act. I do. Mm, yes, okay. yes. So she brings them into the court. Into the courtroom, like, and this was like unheard of, of course. Even today, that would be like. Well, no, it's like a witness. Yeah, yeah, but like prostitution's like illegal, right? So you're like you would have to. I don't know, like how would that that even work? Because then you're testifying. Well, that's why. People are fighting so hard to make prostitution legal because of situations because like that. Like, like people yeah. can't, because they don't have the same protections. Yeah, yeah. But it works. She is able to confirm yeah. his adultery. They grant her the divorce. She assumes the rights of Oak Hill mm-hmm. and moves there with her children. Mm-hmm. And kind of like, unfortunately, was kind of ostracized from Salem society, which I mean, I guess given the actions that she took during that time, I can see why they would do that, but it's just very sad and frustrating because of course, you know, she, she was in the right. Yeah. And then Nathaniel will go on, live out his days, remarry. And if you 
stroll down to the witch house, but turn a little bit to your right. If you're looking at the witch house, turn to your right, kind of turn almost all the way around. You're going to look at the Salem Inn. Mm, yes. And you'll be looking at the West House. Oh, I didn't know that. It's the largest. You didn't know that? No, no, no. Really? Yeah. Surprised. I don't know every historic home in the city, I'm, Sarah. I'm sorry. I really thought you would know. I haven't. I haven't thought about this story since I gave ghost tours that yeah, way. Yeah. But I used to stop in front of the Salem Inn and would chat briefly about Nathaniel West and but the prostitutes. Yes, and the tunnels. We called them ladies of the night. Oh, I know. You can be a prostitute during the day. Jeez. <laughs> True story. <laughs> but yes. The West House of the Salem Inn. So uh, I think there's there's one other place that you can visit if you want to have anything to do with Mr. Elias Haskell Derby, and that is the Charter Street Bearing Point. So if any of you are wondering uh, where the final resting place of America's first millionaire, the, the great and illustrious Elias Haskell Derby is, um, as you look at the entrance to uh, the Charter Street Bearing Ground, uh, from Charter Street, you have these. Which I don't think is an entrance anymore. Right. So, so you, you have, have to, to be standing outside yeah. outside the, the fencing there. As you look uh, on, you have these large chest tombs, and one of them is the Derby tomb. And uh, from what we can discover is he is buried in the ground right there. So it's kind of funny. We were, we came to a point in this research, we asked ourselves, like, how did he die? At sixty years old, I mean, he shouldn't have shouldn't have croaked that early. Yeah. And where is he buried? And for some reason, it was kind of it, it wasn't readily available. Usually, for someone of this stature, this it should be it, readily it, available. Like on his Wikipedia page, he died here of this. He is entombed here. Exactly, but and nothing. No, so we had to do a little more digging and uh, found a few rather credible sources. Shout out to Dan Fury of Black Cat Tours. He wrote a book called If These Stones Could Speak. And in it, it does mention how Elias is entombed right at that left-hand side as you walk into the yeah. Charter Street Cemetery. So I'm sitting here, we're looking online, trying to find where it is, these resources. We were at the public library yesterday and I was like, you know what, hold on, I got a book. And uh, so I went and checked that out. And then we're like, is. wait a minute, do we really just walk by this guy all the time and not even know? There is no longer an entrance uh, sign there, but there used to be this big one. If you look at old pictures from Salem or if you've been here within the last couple of years, there's a big entrance sign to Charter Street Cemetery that lists all the significant people that are buried mm -hmm. there. Der Derby was uh, Samuel McIntyre's on there. Uh, Magistrate Hathorne. Magistrate Hathorne. Mayflower Passenger. Forgetting his name right now. Richard Moore. Captain Richard Moore. Richard Captain Moore. Richard Moore. Thank you. But there is no mention of Derby. Of Derby. How, how is, you know, I we've don't. got a street named after him. We've got the wharf still named after him. We've got several buildings that are tied to him that are yeah. still standing and are are held on to because of their significance. But somehow his bearing point doesn't is, seem it, to be. And so un unless there is just uh, some total incorrect information here. Uh, that he's just been left off the list, which is ridiculous. It's very surprising. Yeah. Very surprising. So, hey, the more you know. The more you know. So uh, we have mentioned uh, a few times this term King Derby. Um, and we mentioned the beginning that it is given to him uh, post-mortem significantly uh, by Mr. Nathaniel Hawthorne. And it is from an excerpt in the Scarlet Letter. And so we just thought we'd take a minute and read that to you. <clears throat> in my native town of Salem, at the head of what? Half a century ago, in the days of old King Derby, was a bustling wharf, but which is now burdened with decayed wooden warehouses and exhibits few or no symptoms of commercial life except perhaps a bark or brig halfway down its melancholy length, discharging hides, or near at hand, a Nova Scotian schooner pitching out her cargo of firewood. At the head, I say, of this dilapidated wharf, which the tide often overflows, <laughs> still does, still does. 
and along which, at the base and in the rear of the row of buildings, the track of many languid years is seen in a border of unthrifty grass. Here, with a view from its front windows, a dawn, this not very enlivening prospect, and thence across the harbor stands a spacious edifice of brick. That Salem brick. We love the Salem brick. <laughs> he's, he's, of course, here talking about the uh, new, newer customs house um, where in which he worked. Uh, which he, you can also once again yeah. see. If you're, if, so to bring us back to what we were just talking about, put yourself back in that great age of sail in that time on the waterfront during Derby's heyday, you'll be standing looking at the customs house. Derby's home is right to the right. It'll live right there. Right there. And it's fascinating this, how, how Hawthorne paints how far we've fallen from that great age of sail mm -hmm. and how, you know, sort of these old, these days of old King Derby. It is quite incredible to think, you know, that we've rounded out this story, how much fluctuation mm -hmm. there was in the economy at that time. You think back to Richard Derby, his father, he was really the start of this merchant family creates this business, gives him a great foundation, teaches him some of the skills, brings him in as a bookkeeper. Then Derby takes it to the next level, becomes this incredibly successful entrepreneur. But then, given the environment, just the, the nature what of was happening at the time, geopolitical issues and things, just the, the rise and fall of different trade goods and items. It's just so many factors played into that, that, decline and it's quite fascinating to look back and see just how much how different of lives those three individuals lived yeah. even though they were just one generation apart and then what those effects are even to this day on the Salem that you all know and love so I think that's going to round out the story but before we go we do have a slight request to make so there are two things as we asked you for funny tunnel stories, mm -hmm. say you countered some group in town that told you something outrageous, we still want those. We'd be interested to hear. But we are going to be doing a Salem ghost stories episode this summer. Soon. So that's, that, yeah, it's coming this summer. It's coming up soon. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's coming up so soon. It's already May. Yeah, I know. But we are going to be doing a Salem ghost stories episode. I know everyone's always asking people to write in their paranormal stories. But, like, we want Salem-centered stories. Yeah. I have had just one experience, and I could easily disprove it. I don't know about you. Uh, no? No. But I know that they're probably out there. Yeah. Did, did you stay at the merchant and experience the... Did you take a ghost tour yeah. and capture some image on, at, uh, at on your point, camera? Yeah. Uh, or the Gardner Pingree House, or the Hawthorne Hotel, or the Salem Inn, or the Ropes Mansion, or... Or maybe you're just walking around town at yeah. 3 a.m. and you saw something. Anything. We are going to be telling you some of the major ghost stories and legends that plague Salem streets to this day. But we also want to hear if you've ever had an individual encounter yourself. And I'm just going to throw this out there. It's very far away, but just wanted to get people thinking about it because I ended up passing two weddings this past weekend as I was walking around town. Yeah, Salem is a super hot spot to get married if you haven't already figured out. I want to hear Salem's, I want to hear people's Salem love stories. Okay, so, so let me get this straight. You want to hear about all the dead people? No, what? And all the ghosts, oh, yeah, yeah. all the hauntings. Yeah. And all the people falling in love. Yes. I think that that's like a good description of you. I'm just going <laughs> to. Uh. <laughs> I've never thought about it that way. Um, yes. So I want the ghosts and I want the love. <laughs> I would love to do a special next, come next, like February time, mm -hmm. have something ready for everyone and tell all these Salem love stories. I don't know about you, but I can't tell you how many people I have met whether when I was working as a bartender here in town or as a tour guide as well, people that come to Salem to either get married, celebrate their anniversary, celebrate their engagement, get engaged, re, re, uh, um, renew your vows. Yeah. Yeah. Any, anything, any, any type. Weddings if at, you, if you had a bad Tinder date, maybe give me the bad stories too. Oh. <laughs> okay. Maybe that's a little more accurate to your personality. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, but at, at the Hawthorne, on, I've seen Weddings on the Common, House of Seven Gables, Bora, Vamp Fangs. They have a whole Dark Weddings line. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, hit us up with uh, your good stories, your bad stories, your worst stories. Just give your... me all the Salem love. Yeah, yeah. And we'll tuck them away in a nice little folder. And come next year, we'll have a nice, at least one episode, possibly more. And we'll be spreading the Salem love. <coughs> so give me your Salem ghosts and Salem love. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So thanks again for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed this brief overview of Elias Heskett Derby's life. In our next episode, we're going to be getting out of the house and taking you to all of the cemeteries in Salem. Not literally, we will be recording from inside, but we are going to be venturing out to all the different cemeteries beforehand. we we'll talk about some of the people, some of the stones, some of the artworks, some of the locations, some of the popular ones, some of the least popular ones. Uh, so uh, we know you all like... Dead people. Yeah, <laughs> we do too. Uh, but till then, don't forget to subscribe, leave a review, be sure to tell a few of your friends. And follow us on all the socials. We are at Salem the Podcast on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. And of course, if you have any questions about anything, uh, either one of us, what we do, uh, just email us at hello at salemthepodcast.com. And if you're coming to Salem, be sure to book a tour with Jeff and myself. Links to both of those are in the show notes. Thanks for listening. See you later. Mm-hmm.